There are three main types. You can have acute total asphyxia, there can be prolonged partial asphyxia, and there may be an acute event overlapping on partial asphyxia. Even though we may not be able to differentiate exactly which category it comes in, the complex of issues that come up, the clinical presentation, the timing of onset of seizures, the findings on MRA, they may point the direction to which type this falls under. So acute perinatal asphyxia usually happens with a sentinel event. So most of the asphyxia in the developing developed world belongs to this category because there is very good obstetric assessment, there is close monitoring of the fetal distress and everything. So the interventions are taken on time. But when there is a sentinel event happening, it's very uh, abrupt. It, you cannot always predict it. So this happens even in the developed world where there is good obstetric care. So prolab prolapsed umbilical cord uh, or cord prolapse is a very dangerous thing. Uterine rupture may happen suddenly, especially in a multigravida with previous cesarean. Abruption again happens as an accident and acute blood loss from the cord can happen due to fetometanol hemorrhage or in twin to twin transfusion. There may be any condition that causes an abrupt reduction in maternal cardiac output. It may be a maternal illness, a maternal accident or injury, and this will affect the blood flow to the fetus. So as you can see, most of this we cannot predict. It's an accident of nature. And obviously, uh, it can happen in any setup, even if the obstetric care is good. The key here is to recognize it early, and it's basically a matter of luck where the mother happens to be in the right place at the right time. So this is an abruption where there is a collection of blood behind the placenta, the retroplacental clot. When the placenta is lifted off, there is actually no effective gas exchange that can go to the baby, and so the baby is asphyxiated. A true knot is very rare, and sometimes a true knot may happen without really obstructing the flow. So again, it's nature's miracle. In the acute total asphyxia, the fetus is suddenly and rapidly deprived of his or her lifeline. The diving reflex is not activated due to the rapid insult. There is no multi-system dysfunction. The damage to the central brain is typical here, and it involves the thalamus, basal ganglia, and the brain stem. So these areas are key, and you may recognize abnormalities in these areas on the MRI scan, which is done by day three or so. There is usually sparing of the cerebral cortex because the cortex is affected by watershed infarct, which we will discuss in the uh, persistent prolonged asphyxia. The survivors may develop the extra pyramidal type of cerebral palsy, the dystonic cerebral palsy, or the uh, dyskinesia and so on. So this is the reason the basal ganglia uh, thalamus affects this uh, tone mainly. So it's a uh, dystonic CP that you get here. The prolonged partial asphyxia, on the other hand, there are lesions in the cerebral cortex in the watershed type of distribution. So same way the diving reflex is trying to protect the watershed area where there is a junction between the two blood vessels of the brain is the area where the blood flow drops first. And uh, there is multi-organ involvement with active diving reflex in most of these cases. Because there is high amount of cortical involvement, you may have spastic cerebral palsy at follow-up. The cognitive impairment severity depends on the extent and severity of the lesion overall. It can be quite severe. You do see uh, any case from hemiplegia, monoplegia, or spastic diplegia, or it may be a spastic quadriplegia with microcephaly. Many cases have an acute event overlapping on prolonged partial asphyxia. For example, I mentioned growth-restricted babies are compromised due to the placental circulation being affected, and they also tolerate labor poorly. So if there is an acute event overlapping, they will not tolerate it. 